Good evening. This is Gloria Taylor. I want to welcome you to the 67th edition of A Gathering of Priestesses. And we have with us this evening the lovely Miss Yeshe Rabbit Matthews from Oakland, California, and Catherine Ravenwood from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you both for being with us this evening. I want to thank you all for being with us. Uh, whoever is registered, please let me know you're here. And I'm always thrilled to hold space that we can have this event where we get to talk about be, what it means to be a priestess and how you can do that in a real world. Uh, sometimes things don't, as, as a friend of mine used to say, uh, a business plan lasts as long until it hits reality. Sometimes being a priestess in reality is more difficult than other times. And if some of you have watched before, you'll notice I have different hair color and different length. So I want to let you know that I cut off 12 inches of hair and have sent it to Locks for Love uh, so that they can make a wig for some deserving child who has cancer. And I highly recommend that if you decide to cut your hair, that you do donate it. There's also a couple of other foundations that are doing the same thing. It costs nothing. Uh, apparently, there's a rumor out there that it costs. Uh, it's not true. They will accept donations, accept donations of hair without donations of money. So. Um, just wanted to go over that because I uh, want you to know that uh, we are delighted to be here and we have Anna from Chicago and greetings from the Chicago based Lyceum of Alexandria and the Fellowship of Isis. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Anna. And Marie Claude de la Vallebrette. Marie Claude, where are you from? Tell us about, a little bit about yourself and I'll we'll come back on that. Now I'd like to go over and ask um, Yeshe Rabbit the question we ask all of our uh, guests and that is, what got you started on the priestess path? Well, um, I remember being very small, maybe six or seven, and <clears throat> <clears throat> Lori Cabot, the Witch of Salem, used to go on the Phil Donahue show every year around Halloween and talk about witchcraft. And I remember watching that show with my mother and seeing her in her flowing black robes talking about the goddess. And she was so bold and dramatic in her appearance, and she was so... Um, decisive in her way of speaking and she seemed very confident and self-possessed to me and I just loved everything about her and you could say that it started there because from there on I knew that this existed and that it was my job to go find it so I I went looking for it and I eventually found my way to California where I connected with women's circles and um, worked within the Dianic tradition. Okay, so were you out of the Los Angeles uh, church or of the Dianic tradition, or was that up in Oakland? That was in Oakland. Okay, who was your leader I, there? Z Budapest. Oh, okay. Well, Z started the one in Los Angeles as well. And uh, we've been trying to get her on the show, but she was in a car accident not long after I started the show last year and um, was definitely not able to do it for a while. I haven't gone back to her uh, because I've been booked, but I would love to have her back on the show. So if any of you are contacts with Z Budapest or... Uh, Tell her I'm still interested in getting her on the show. I'd love to make do a special edition for her. And so as you have um, sort of gotten indoctrinated whenever you were a little girl, I mean, it sounds, I mean, that Phil Donahue show was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even sure you're old enough to watch the Phil Donahue show. So... <laughs> 
I loved it. I had the biggest crush on him. I liked him, and I liked Johnny Carson. <laughs> yeah. And your mother let you stay up for Johnny Carson. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're either much older than you look, or your mother was very forward thinking. Uh, <laughs> well, I was a tiny little insomniac, and I, uh, I, I think I gave her a real run for her money. But since I liked Johnny Carson and he put me to sleep, she let me. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds great. So one of the things we wanted to talk about is some of the work that you have done in Tibet. So could you tell us first, there's a particular nunnery that you have been associated with, and um, there is a female Buddha, I guess you would use that phrase, who is associated with that nunnery, and I can't say her name, so I'm going to let you do it. Great. So um, the nunnery that we are talking about is at Sogyal Lhotso in central Tibet. It is about a 30-minute drive from Samye, which is the largest temple complex that represents all the four major traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. And Sogyal Lhotso is the birthplace of the female Buddha Yeshe Sogyal. Yeshe Sogyal was born after her mother had a prophetic dream and had visionary experiences when she conceived. Um, and on the day that Yeshe Sogyal was born, a lake sprung up out of the ground near her home, a spring spontaneously began flowing and formed a lake outside of her parents' home. And um, signs like these in Tibet were considered manifestations of a message about the arrival of a Buddha. And Yeshe Tsogyal was no exception. She was reputed to be extraordinarily intelligent and beautiful, and that at a very early age she um, dedicated herself to the Dharma and to being of service. She didn't want to marry when her parents were trying to arrange a political marriage for her between two rival um, warlords of nearby territories. She resisted and said no, she didn't want that. What happened next is that her father it was enraged and he sent her out of the family compound and, and when you're in Tibet you see how this works there are these walled in compounds that might house one to four to ten buildings whole families live in these compounds the walls are there for um, protection against bandits and protection against rising waters protection against wandering animals protection for livestock so the, her father threw her out of the family compound and said, whichever one of these two warlords catches you first can have you. So she was caught by one of them, and he dragged her back to his camp, and he beat her so severely she almost died. And when she um, was lying there near death, she um, had received a visitation from the Buddha that was um, a miraculous healing and enabled her to, and, and in Tibet they talk, they talk about, in, in the tradition they talk about cities, magical powers. She received the power of cities, two of them. One, to become invisible and escape the camp undetected, and two, the ability to run very fast. And so she ran very quickly across the Tibetan plateau where she was promptly captured by an, the other warlord. And he beat her severely. Meanwhile, the um, king of Tibet, um, King Trisong Detsen, heard of this woman who was causing all this trouble between two of his um, protectorates. And so he went to go find out, and he found her in her um, conquered state, and he took her out of there, and he put her into his harem. Once she was living in the harem, she continued to avail herself of all the resources of the court and became very highly educated, so much so that she became an advisor to the king and an advisor to his advisors. His advisors resisted her presence, and she still prevailed. 
And when Padmasambhava, who brought the Dharma from India to Tibet, came into Tibet, he selected her to be his consort. He said that what he needed was a partnership with a magical woman. And she was, in fact, a magical woman. And together, they formed the basis of everything that is known as Tibetan Buddhism today. Um, she was gifted with the, she's said to have been gifted with flawless memory, and that she committed texts, Dharma texts, to memory and hid them as mind treasures in the mind of all beings, so that at certain times in our lives when we feel lost or bereft or we're suffering, we can recall the wisdom that is the Dharma and alleviate our suffering. So she, I mean, there's so many stories I could go on, but I know it's, I've just explained a lot. But this is her birthplace, and the nuns who gather there are very significant because Yeshit Sogil, as you can tell from her story, is a, she is a vehicle of triumph over patriarchal forces. And these nuns are the only nuns in Tibet that are in an all-female-run nunnery that is not a fix to a monastery under um, a monastic rule. And so to support the temple there, I've been a fundraiser and I also visited the temple and brought supplies to the nuns from the West. We brought vitamins, we brought clothing, we brought dental supplies um, and other gifts. And then I've been supporting the construction of a new temple there so that the nuns, the 16 nuns in residence there, can properly take care of the still existing lake, the miraculous lake, which is said to be an oracular lake, um, and the springs and the, all of the sacred land. And we've just been buying up, our, the organization I'm affiliated with, Janana Sukha, has just been buying slowly the land all around there and protecting it. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the original battered woman, uh, the story of her, you know, the story of Ikshel, uh, who's the Mayan moon goddess, and is somewhat similar in that she was beaten by her husband so severely that uh, she went and hid uh, and became the moon so that she would not have to show her face at the same time as he the sun was showing his. And mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting that even as we have changed, there are many things that have stayed the same. And your point about the fact that the nunnery has, um, this is the only nunnery that is not under a monastic rule. Um, is an interesting comment because I know there are nunneries in Tibet. I know that there's several of them that are quite flourishing. Uh, I know that there's an, actually a nunnery attached to Dharmasala where the, uh, the uh, Dalai Lama lives. And, um, but, uh, you know, my guess is that for those 16 nuns, it's a tremendous struggle for them, I mean, not only to have to survive in Tibet, which is a tremendous struggle in and of itself, but um, in case anybody doesn't know, most of Tibet is above 11,000 feet, and it's uh, very cold, uh, very dry, um, so a lake would be a very beneficial thing to have. Um, Winter lives there, uh, and uh, the the for them to survive through the Chinese occupancy, through the years I don't have, I don't know what we're talking. We're talking about about fifteen hundred or twenty five hundred years. Um, well, uh, the Chinese occupation of Tibet began in 1959. Yeah, I know, but um, about whenever... Before, uh, that, it would have, it, before that, um, we're thinking probably 
at least for the for this ex, this location has been in existence since the 800s AD. So you know, other places in Tibet like Samye is older than that. Right. Um, so, but yeah, we're talking about th thousands of years of freedom before this occupation and a complete change. One of my friends who's from Tibet said, imagine coming home to your house one day and all of a sudden somebody else lives there and you're standing in your house and they're telling you you have to leave or that you can't live there or they're telling you what the rules are for your own house. Everything looks the same, all your items are still there, but this person now says that he owns it and then you'll get an idea of what this is like. It's very uh, traumatic and confusing. Um, the landscape of Tibet, you're right, it is very harsh and this particular nunnery is located at about uh, thir between 13 and 14,000 feet um, in altitude. It is in a verdant valley that is amidst a very dry plain. Um, Central Tibet is a lot, there's a lot of sort of almost desert and, and sandy places um, that are like um, you might sort of say, like there are big places that look kind of like the salt flats in Utah and mountains that look like the mountains in Utah that are stone and sand and very, very dry. So you're absolutely right. There's this lush valley and this valley is said to be the yoni of the goddess that has the waters running through it. Um, Southern Tibet is a little bit easier climate and altitude. It's below 10,000 feet, and it's in some places a rainforest. Um, but Central Tibet and and most of the places that are sacred, you're right, they're very difficult. And these nuns, I mean, just this year, have running water indoors for the first time. Wow. And um, they when we were there last year before they built the, the new temple, they had an out, a big outdoor sink. Um, their bathroom is, you walk outside of the monastery, or, you know, the, the nunnery complex and into a field and then there's a, a hole in the ground or the field. Um, and there's not really anywhere, I mean, their accommodations are very cramped. So, you know, they, are, they also are not all given permits to be nuns there. So um, women who would be able to come and, and participate there often are not, are not given permits, so then they have to come and go, or they have to work there as... Um, a housekeeper or they have to do something else so that they can be close to the community if they're not granted their permit and permits are granted sort of haphazardly. So it is, it's a very challenge. Are the permits granted by the Chinese overlords? The permits are granted by the government, yeah, the, the Chinese government. And there's only one way to get them. You have to take classes um, and you have to adhere to very strict rules of conduct. Uh, and one of the other things that people may not know about Tibet, but a lot of people from Tibet were forcibly resettled in China. Uh, many of them were forced to go and live in um, rice paddy areas where it was like nothing they had ever seen in their life. They, you know, they were taking them from 11,000 to 14,000 feet and putting these people at sea level or slightly above. And, yeah. and they did not treat them well. I, I'm going to leave it at that. They did not treat them well. They did not take them there and give them a really nice house to live in, let's say. So um, there's a number of issues there, and I'm not going to go down that political road because I'm still mad about it, and mm -hmm. I, this is not the place for that. Um, so in your doing your work with the nuns and with the monastery, uh, the nunnery in Tibet, um, how have you grown with this work? This. Um 
you know, I my mom said something really, really good about this, actually. I was telling her how I've been doing fundraising for this temple and campaigning for these nuns and bringing, you know, I brought supplies last year and I was scheduled to bring supplies this year, but our permits were denied, so we have to try in the spring instead. Um, my mom said, you know what I think is interesting about this is that this is the thing that you are doing in your life that will probably have the greatest benefit to the most people, but no one will ever know that you did it. And that is the great learning of the Dharma and of this particular experience, is that we do right because it's right, not because it's going to make us um, you know, it does not not for a reputation, not for a cornerstone with your name on it, not so that you have a um, you know a, a, a sort of a plaque dedicated in perpetuity. That's not it. We do the work because the work must be done. That is the learning of this, and it is to me one of the opportunities of greatest grace that I've been allowed to have in my life. Um, so that's a profound difference from what I experience in um, spiritual community in the U.S., which has uh, more of a, I guess you might say, sometimes has more of a, um, a commercial element to it. There's sort of a, a, a Western eth ethos about it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's one thing. On a very practical level, my work in Tibet and my practice in Tibet under harsh physical circumstances has increased my capacity for practice. I can breathe differently. I can chant for longer. I can sit for longer. I have less attachment to the practice going anywhere and just much more ability to experience a practice for what it is in the moment. Um, and that has worked its way into my priestesshood here in the West as well. Uh, I have less interest in theatrics and more interest in deep, profound silences um, in my work as a public priestess. Those are like just, you know, like visceral changes that have happened. And then I think that emotionally, just as my as myself as 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 a person, you know, beneath any anything related to service or related to priestesshood, I feel more whole as a person because I feel like I've answered a call that was in my spirit. From when I was a child, I wanted to go to Tibet. I had a sort of an unusual interest in Tibet from the minute I learned there was such a country. And so there's just this really palpable sense of satisfaction that I have 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 entered the stream that I was called to enter as a being, I guess you might say. That's and at the same time you know and, and at the same time I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Dharma practitioner, but I'm an avowed goddess practitioner. And it's not like I don't see all of the problems with the structures and patriarchy within the lineages of Buddhism today. So it's just this really fruitful crossroads where I learn a lot and I kind of have to do this little bit of a balancing act and be like, well, I go as far here with this as I can but then there are places I won't go. And then over here, I'm doing this, but I can bring some of this with me. And so it's just this, this fluid space where I have a lot that I'm learning personally. Yeah, it reminds me, and Raven's heard me say this before, of a sign in my grandmother's kitchen. She used to have a sign up that's over the sink that said, if you see a job, it's yours. <laughs> yes. And she meant it, you know. You, you were not yes. allowed 
loud to say, Grandma, we need to wash the dishes. Yeah, go do it. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how it should be, actually. Yeah, so uh, in your IRL, I just saw that term you recently, someone used it, I couldn't believe it in an email, in real life, you mm -hmm. are a store owner and a uh, practitioner in the Oakland area. And where has that been for you in the, all of this? I mean, is it something that you find is deepening? Is it something that is just sustaining? Where would you say that that is? Oh, it's it's <laughs> it's been exploding. <laughs> um, my store. Uh, so as a businesswoman, um, I am blessed with an amazing business partner, a queer astrologer named Astro Berry, and he is. Um, has been uh, he and I he he and I were both in New York City at the same time doing master's degrees in women's studies. I was at Sarah Lawrence and he was at Columbia or at, at NYU, and we never met. But then out here on the West Coast we met and we got together and we started our business. And his mission of creating a space that empowers women's leadership has given me. Um, and his commitment to using um, his his ability to to kind of turn that over and provide that has been a great learning experience for me. And I love my store. And our mission as a, as a store is to provide people with beautiful, magical things that they love. And at the Sacred Well, we employ uh, 10, 11 people now who are um, you know, from many different walks of life and many different spiritual backgrounds. Um, we have readers and we have classes. And so it's a very active community hub. Um, I like to think of my store as being like the store that supports the temple that the building really is. You know, the, the commercial aspect of it is just like the temple gift shop of what we really are doing, which is hosting space for the divine and very strongly oriented toward goddess. We have monthly goddess, many different monthly goddess events, um, but we also have practitioners from all different fields that come in and teach us about everything from angels to zithers and ancient music of Rome. I mean, it's it's really varied. So it's a it's a it's a community hub, and then as um, a presiding high priestess of Come As You Are Pagan Congregation, I have um, provided leadership and training to um, a community that numbers around 350 people and has 58 dedicated members who provide the service to the community. We have um, public service events where we do fundraisers for local organizations, beach cleanup. Yesterday there were several of our members who went and um, fed 150 people at a food bank. Um, and then we also do retreats and events for our members. Um, we host open drop-in public rituals about 25 times a year. and. Um, we do pastoral care. That's one of the newest things that we're doing where we reach out to homebound, ailing, or otherwise overwhelmed members of our community. And we maintain a website and we do a newsletter and things like that. And I um, just submitted our IRS application to become a church because we have long-term projects in the works for building um, pagan sanctuaries and um, uh, specifically uh, wild land preserves all over the country. So that's been popping too. I mean, right now I'm 41 years old and I feel like, you know, there's um, something that happens astrologically around this time in one's life called the Uranus opposition. And it's kind of like that big visionary. Um, Uranus comes along and says, are you really doing what you wanted to be doing with your life? And I just feel like 
um, I feel like right now is a time of firing on all cylinders in my life and um, figuring out how to navigate all of that has been and still make time for self-care has been challenging. I feel it's like it's like you have a whole bunch of extra cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> I am really blessed to work with amazing people. I I am blessed to have amazing teammates in everything that I do. And I think that they're all working on all their cylinders too. And so yeah, our cylindrical power is collectively pretty mighty and I'm feeling I'm feeling blessed to be able to do the work with them. Awesome. The, the thing I was impressed with when I looked at your website is it's obviously that you are a commercially successful priestess. And I, I realize that's not a phrase you normally hear, but for many of us, we would like the priestess part of us to be our full-time job, if you want to call it that. And most of us would like somebody else to send us the money so that we can do that. And you are... Uh, you know, obviously have figured out a way to provide yourself with a commercially successful business that you are running in, in a, a very high-end way and at the same time it supports your work as a priestess, it, it supports, uplifts it and, and puts it out there in such a way that you have the ability to um, be very, very, uh, and I, that's why I wanted you to go into this is because so many of our listeners are at that point where they're saying, well, I want to be a priestess, but I got to stay a programmer because I want to make money. And I want you to, the people to see, you know what? You don't have to stay anything. If you want to be a priestess and you want to be supported as a priestess, it's time to start doing it because we need more priestesses out there doing the work. It's true. I think that, you know, if I if I were to, and, and truly, like, this is coming from a humble place, this may or may not work for everybody, but for my little Taurus self, what has worked has been, I made a decision, very, very clear decision, about what I do for money and what I do that is service. And I chose to create a certain balance in my life so that if... And I actually think that one of the problems that a lot of women who are priestesses face is that there are the people who are sourcing you as a priestess um, and you have this sort of, you're torn, I think, often because a lot of the people who really need you are not able to pay you. And then you, you feel kind of weird if you don't do the service because it's what the goddess has called you to do. Mm -hmm but it feels unsustainable if you don't get paid and there's this kind of vicious cycle. I think that by deciding this money-making thing is in direct correlation to my ability to serve, what I at least have done for myself is I know that I have to give a certain amount of time to being a business owner in a completely non-resentful way every day. And I have to give away a lot of love, time, and energy in a completely, for free, in a completely non-resentful way every day. So the one of them has to sustain the other one. The people who need me the most, most of the time can't pay me. And the people who can pay me are not often in a state of as much desperation. And learning that there is no profit in someone's pain and that where I get my money from has to feel clean to me was a very, very strong motivator in guiding me to provide commercial readings and commercial products as my money-making venture so that my ceremonies, my initiations, my counsel, my comfort and kindness in times of grief, all of that gets to just be free will and if you'd like to make a donation, great, and if you don't, there's nothing expected. 
but I really had to balance that out. And it, and I mean, as I mentioned, it, it, it's, I'm 41. It, it has taken me 13 years of very solid effort to be able to do that. It wasn't like that in the beginning. It was much more confusing. It was much more kind of unsustainable and all over the place. But I know now that one fe feeds the other and that I have to take care of both. And I don't have, and, and, that, and that in order for all of it to work, I can't really have any resentment about any of it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you resent your job, and your job is what's sustaining your priestesshood, you will eventually find ways to resent your priestesshood because the energy th that, that is sustaining that priestesshood is tainted. It, this is my opinion. So I may, be, I may be wrong, but that's how it's worked for me. Um, or I should say that's when it hasn't worked, that's what was going on. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, it's... Well, it makes a lot of sense. And considering I'm a Taurus, too, I have uh, very strong opinions. So, obviously, you have very strong opinions. What's your birth date? May 6th. Okay, well, I'm April 26th. So, uh, and, you know, one of the things that uh, in in thinking about this, and, and I do think that this is something that, you know, a lot of us have trouble with, is the idea that we do what we do, and wherever it is, we can't have the resentment, because the resentment drains us. It, it uh, if we're doing tarot readings and we're um, not getting the money we want, or the feedback we want or the uh, whatever it is that is required in order to make us satisfied with it, then we should stop doing tarot readings. It's that simple. Uh, yeah. If we're doing priestess work and we resent the fact that other people aren't doing their jobs, I heard this one today, and it's like, uh, I don't remember them signing up for that job. You know, and you you've basically taken this on as a as a as a practice, and if they don't do their job, that's their problem, not yours. So don't be angry with them. And and I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, in in uh, my community, we do a lot of work collaboratively. Mm -hmm. So. If one person hasn't done the thing they agreed to do, it definitely can impact everybody. So we do, that's a time when I could see us being like, no, really, you have to do your job. No, this was a case where <laughs> was upset because nobody would volunteer to do a particular job, and which uh, they basically were not, obviously they weren't in, that interested in having that particular thing happening. If you're not willing to get, if volunteers are not willing to show up, it's not because it's you know it's probably a bad idea. Uh, and if you require volunteers, uh, that's not going to happen either. I mean, our time, our energy is the most important things we've got to spend. And you know, um, the idea that we're going to give away our time and our energy to something that we're not totally committed to. You know, don't think that that's going to happen. I mean, and I think that whether we're it's priestess work or any other work, you know, um, if you expect people to show up and work at your store and they're not totally committed to being there at your store, there's an easy solution for that one. You fire Yeah, it. it's interesting. Because navigating over the years, um, I started my community, my spiritual community, a year before I opened my my store. So they're they're siblings, um, and in the spiritual community, we work on a concept of joyful service. So um, we have lots and lots of different ways people can participate, and each of those ways comes with its sort of requirements. Like if you sign up for this this role, these are the mm -hmm. duties that come along with this role. And, you know, in this way, you might not love every single thing that you're supposed to do, but you're going to like most of it. Your joyful service is what you freely signed up to do in your role. And the other thing that we do is we change roles from year to year. Um, you don't have to. It's not obligatory, but 
there's an availability of shifting your dynamic and your role from year to year so that nothing gets stale. And that has been really um, rewarding. And then the way that I ended up bringing a little bit of that into my business is that um, people who work at my store above and beyond whatever the basic clerk, clerk tasks are of retail, um, they each basically create their own projects and write their own job descriptions. So um, they tell me what they're going to want to bring to the table that's above and beyond, you know, answer questions and ring people up, right? So we might have someone who comes and says, well, I've been really interested in studying about herbalism. So what I'd like to do is to take on stocking all the herbs and placing the orders and making sure the herb jars stay full because it'll help me identify these herbs I'm working with. Great. You know, I love that. And then other people will come and say, well, you know, I've been thinking, I saw that you had these kinds of stones and those kinds of stones, and I was thinking about making little packets of those stones all together to, to, and charging them, and then that's a product. And I'm like, great, go for it. I love to see what people bring to the table because it's most of the time stuff I wouldn't have thought of. Um, I tend to think in a linear way, though it's a creative way. Mm -hmm. um, so I can just sort of focus on one thing at a time, and I get through it all. But um, having people who kind of swoop in with these different ideas and um, new ways of looking at it has, I think, been a big part of why we're successful, because there's always something that's dynamic, and that the person who's activating it feels really excited about and interested in. And it may not be my thing, but I don't need to stand in the way of it. It's just, you know, their thing. And maybe it'll take off. Yeah, Whole Foods has uh, some of that concept. Uh, whenever you, uh, it's interesting. I have one of my uh, friends, her daughter works for Whole Foods or work for them. Whenever you interview for them, you have to fill out a um, uh, questionnaire that says, what are you most passionate about? And then they um, try to put you into the area you are most passionate about. And if you want customer contact, they put you in one place. And if you want no customer contact, they put you somewhere else. And those are all questions that they ask. So even though they're not, um, you know, it is it is the holy church of groceries, but uh, <laughs> our whole paycheck, as we used to call it in Seattle. And uh, yeah. but it is still an I the idea of getting people to work where they want to be, where they will be the most passionate about uh, taking care of that product or that you know the you know providing people with information. Um, and you know I know that that's very important. Um, I, Cynthia had a comment here. She says leading leadership and leading well can be separate from priestessing, and I agree. It can be. I think it's very important that we be able to be leaders. Uh, I think we need, need, but as priestesses, I think we have to recognize that we are also leaders, and mm -hmm. that learning how to be a leader um, takes effort. It's not something you get to do. You know, it's not something they teach you in school, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and she says sometimes I've been in. Uh, fortunate in others leading in various areas and I can concentrate on the hands-on priestess work that I love. Well Cynthia that's great and we're glad that that's so and that's what we're basically talking about is finding that which you're passionate about and supporting you in that whether or not it's uh, in rocks or herbs or water or I mean my friend Raven is is the water priestess here and she's a great ceremonialist She's totally into altars, and I think that's all wonderful and all hers. And I don't want to. I don't want to do those things. Um, and I think it's wonderful that she's willing to do them. Yep. So, <laughs> isn't that right, Raven? That's right. And I also work forty hours a week at a job. Yeah, but you work where, where I am very much in service. So, funny how it's kind of worked out. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you're the high priestess of the Episcopal Church. Is what I, you 
are. Might be. <laughs> we'll have to get you a name badge that says that and see what they have to say. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I try to keep a little lower profile than that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so I did want to, before we run out of time here, talk about the mother of new time. And oh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, the Mother of the New Time project is a project that um, my women's circle that I belong to and I put together four years ago. It's now in its fourth year. It's a five-year project, and in and it has been a a um, yearly elemental cycle where we started the first year with the element of Earth. And we invited women all around the world to participate with us in blessing a stone each full moon with a particular prayer, um, and then burying the stone and, and burying the stone at the end of the year. And then the second year was our water year, and we blessed and added water, blessed water to a vial of holy water each full moon over the course of the year until it was the end of the year when we then added poured that that vial of blessed water into a living body of water. And then in the third year, it was our fire year. And every single full moon for the year, we wrote the word patriarchy on a piece of paper and burned it and saved all the ashes and scattered the ashes on the winds at the end of the year. So this year is our air year. And every single full moon, we take a feather and we read aloud the ideals of the Mother of the New Time project, which can be found at motherofthenewtime.com. Um, and the, the ideals are about honoring children, honoring our elders, honoring the earth. I mean, there's a long litany of them. We read them aloud, and then we say the prayer over the feather. And at the end of this year, we'll be releasing the feathers back into nature. And then next year is our spirit year. And it's a really big deal because we are going to um, have everyone who's participating continue to do the, the monthly full moon prayer working. And as the culmination of the project, we're going to be building a 40-foot goddess statue that is in full view of a major highway somewhere in the United States. And it's going to be the first of many of these 40-foot goddess statues that my community is hoping to build over the next two decades. Um, it's my belief uh, that if I went, when I was five or six years old, you know, Lori Cabot served as that, like, beacon for me on the Phil Donahue show. But I can also see where if I were five or six years old driving down the freeway with my family and I saw a 40-foot tall goddess statue, a four-story goddess statue, I would feel at home. And so my sense about this is that if we want there to be this visible presence, we have to instantiate it in statues all over the country. So we're starting that project next year. So anyone who wants to follow along with our progress, um, you'll be able to go to motherofthenewtime.com, and that'll take you to our website. Um, right now it directs you to this year's working, which is in the Come As You Are Pagan Congregation site that we have, but as of next year, this will be its own website for this major project that we're going to be doing. Um, so I'm super excited about it, and I, I'm hoping that Goddess Sisters worldwide will support us in this endeavor, because I think that it will make a very powerful visual statement. Oh, I agree. Now, I have to ask you a question, and you have to understand that this comes from a Taurus mind. Why 40 feet? I have the same question. <laughs> Not well, um, there's actually a text, an ancient uh, text that describes the goddess Hecate, a Greek text that describes the goddess Hecate as being 400 feet tall. Now, I don't think that at any point I'm capable yet of building a 400 foot tall statue, <laughs> so I thought 40 would be a good place to start. Okay, I just wondered because 40 is a biblical number which means enough. 
I wonder what would happen if we hacked their technology. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's why there was 40 years in the wilderness and 40 days in the, in the wilderness and the, the use of the word 40 because that's enough. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, I always like the uh, aborigine uh, terms. They have, uh, in their numerating, they have one, two, three, and lots of. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, I do think, you know, that number 40, it came, it came into my mind because of this Hecate reference. But now that you mention it, I kind of think about the interesting implications of taking a biblical number and using it for our own purposes. And, you know, I kind of, I kind of have to say I like the magical transmutation of that action. Um, and, and plus, you know, four stories tall, it seems like that's really impressive. If it were only one story tall, I mean, I've seen one story statues, they're okay. But I mean, I want a four story statue that you can't miss from a freeway. <laughs> so what are your goddess, are the goddess statues all going to be different goddesses? Are you going to choose a thematic goddess that you use over and over? What are you going to do? The first one is going to be the Nile bird goddess, you know, with the where she's got the hands like this and the beakish face and the round breasts and hips that come to a point. Um, that will be the first one. Um, but after that, I don't know. It may be we were thinking that one of the things we are going to try to do as part of the project is that for people who give a certain amount, you know, to the to the construction of the larger statue will give them a, a small version of the statue so that there is a resonance amongst all these statues to the large one. Um, and I'm thinking that thereafter we'll probably have to think about it. I can see where different landscapes might beg different expressions. I can also see the strength in repeating that bird goddess again and again and again. But I think that will have, have, have to be organic. Interesting. Yeah. I love it. I love that. I just love the vision of it. I remember when I was a little kid, we lived in Wyoming, and we didn't take a lot of vacations. This was back in the 50s. But back in the 50s in Wyoming, you could drive for hours and not see another car. And the Burma Shave uh, signs were, we loved seeing them because you read one and then down the road another and another, and they became iconic. And mm -hmm. I could see where the bird goddess is showing up. Would, it could very much be that way. I love that idea. And I love the idea of looking at it from that child's vision. Because when you're a child, everything looks bigger anyway. And to have a 40-foot goddess. Ah. She might seem like 400 feet. <laughs> she might. She might. Yeah. Well, I was just looking real quick. And and wait, what, if, what if all the goddesses walked around at night and got together? Oh, I love that idea. <laughs> I love that. It would be a whole new mythology. Of yes. that, the nice yes. goddess. Yes. yes, I love you it. You totally get it. That's exactly why this needs to happen. We hear the stories of a statue of Hecate, a statue of Aphrodite, a statue of Artemis, statues of Hera. We hear them described in the travel literature. Even when we don't have any um, drawings of them left, we read about them and we know they existed and we know that for the ancient world they were a big deal. Why on earth would they not be a big deal now? They're still the goddess is still a very big deal. And so you're totally getting it, Raven, because it's like how else will we have new mythologies if we don't have objects to dream about? You have to. You have to they have to be they have to be manifested into the, the physical and anchored. You gotta anchor that stuff in. And then they create their own new ley lines and they create their own new magical paths. Yes. And that's what their we own and love that. You know? Mm -hmm. We have temples that still stand, but why do so many of the goddess statues, why are they gone? 
because patriarchy couldn't handle it, so they destroyed them. As with Buddha right. statues or many other things, it's like, we can't handle this magic happening. We can't handle these people having a mythology that's not about our corporations, so we're going to change them. Right, right. Yeah. And I feel like that's, that's the point of this project. It's that if we want to have a new time, we have to give birth to it. Otherwise, we all, we all can see what's happening. You know, I, I feel like until there are some of us, you know, just going back to the comment about leadership, we're, it's correct. Any of us can be a devotional priestess and is a devotional priestess, and this is a great service. But for some of us, there is also this calling, which is to change culture. And Radical girl, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was raised by a good mom and also a very supportive dad. <laughs> there you go. That's great. So um, I was pulling up something here. I wanted to share it with you uh, in case you have any doubts as to what this would look like. Woo! This is... <gasps> This oh. is the goddess Athena in uh, the Parthenon in Nashville. She's wonderful. How tall is she? Uh, tall. That's I, I a big find, I, I, I couldn't fast enough find the, but I knew that she was, Raven, you know, you live there. Yeah, but I had been in the Parthenon and I don't remember that. Well, you obviously that, have to go back. That was very, very, very hard times for me. Let yeah. me ask Google. So, That's but gorgeous. that is basically what you're talking about. I think she's about 40 well, feet tall. Athena statue in the Parthenon in Nashville. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I love that she's gold. 41, 41 feet, 10, 10, 10 inches tall. tall. Making her the right. piece of indoor sculpture in the Western world. <laughs> According to our goddess That's Google, great. the sculptor was Alan Lequeur, L E capital Q U I R E. Oh, very good, very good. I love that statue. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Google this. Feet, Ten inches tall. Forty-one feet. Ten inches. How about that? I suppose we're all kind of sinking into something here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that with you because I, I figured, you know, that's something that not too many people know about. That there's the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee, and with a 40 foot, uh, over 40 foot Athena statue in there. And there's also. Um, uh, I was just noticing there's also a, a chapel of Venus and a chapel of several other goddesses. I don't know what statues they have in there. This is a central one. Um, so, Well, I know the Parthenon, the, the duck pond at the Parthenon is where my child gave up his bottle. And he threw his baba into the lake there. And wow. it was amazing because he'd been talking about it. And I sat by the edge of the lake, and we talked about giving Baba to the lake. And he finally threw it in, and every, I didn't know there were people all around, and they all applauded him and said, what a good boy you are, what a big boy you are. That happened at the Parthenon, but I don't remember Athena being there. <laughs> I dare say, you know, he should go back and see if the, if the, the lake throws a sword at him. <laughs> oh, no. You know, like Lady of the Lake bestowing power. I deserve the sword. I, the sword. <laughs> I, the sword. I would appreciate it. <laughs> no, we're not going to go there. Raven is the priestess of the sword as well. So, um, anyway, so as you're moving forward and you've got this new community church which you are forming. Uh, why don't you let us know how people can get in touch with you if they're interested in getting involved, whether it's in the with the Mother of the New Time or whether it is uh, with your other practices. Hmm? Well, the best way to reach me is through my personal website, wayoftherabbit.com. And from there, you can go to a page about my projects, and you can see 
everything from the Mother of the New Time Project to Come As You Are Pagan Congregation to the store, the Sacred Well. Also, I lead online Monday and Tuesday chanting sessions free of charge if you want to chant to Guanyin or Tara. Um, there will be links to the Temple of Aphrodite, which is one of my projects here in Oakland. And also, there's a new project coming, a new website coming for the um, Hecate Temple that we do at the Dark Moon. So you can also see all the different blogs and stuff that I follow. It would be great to hear from people after the show. I'd be interested to hear if anybody has any other amazing references and resources like the one that you had, Gloria, of that statue. Um, and I've been really grateful to be here. It's been really a very, very pleasant time talking with you. And um, I loved hearing the inspiring story about you donating your hair. I think that's just wonderful. And you look amazing. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for being with us. And we didn't get to the most important question of all. Where did you get the name Rabbit? I was born on the full hair moon, uh -huh. and so I've always had a rabbit-oriented or bunny-oriented nickname. Well, the rabbit is associated with Kuan Yin. Yes, and Aphrodite, actually, another of my devoted goddesses. Well, she is, she is very, it's the fertility thing there, so... And uh, yeah. Raven, thank you for being present and oh, being joy here co-hosting. Uh, Raven is uh, the most brilliant tarot reader on earth. Now watch out, you got another one right here. <laughs> no, uh, Raven still tops. Uh, Yeshe can come in and be number two, but she's not, she hasn't qualified yet for the most brilliant there one. There's no competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, We're all of us. And Raven has um, her book, which is uh, How to Create Sacred Water. And is it is available on Amazon and from Raven, and is the one of the finalists in the Southwest Author uh, Contest. That's why the red thingy on the bottom there. And you're also available. Um, My website is KatherineRavenwood.com, and that's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N Ravenwood.com. Great. And uh, we really appreciate all of you being here. And um, next week we will have on Christy Michaels, who we've put off a couple of times. Uh, uh, first, her, her uh, she was in the middle of doing an event, and it just wasn't going to work. And then I think I had to reschedule her as well. But she will be on. And... We have a special uh, guest who will be coming on the following week uh, who will be on Saturday because she's coming to us from the United Kingdom. So um, next week we'll be back on on Tuesday. The following week we'll be on on Saturday. So uh, I'll get that information out to anyone who's interested. There's always on Facebook. I always have it on a gathering of priestesses. Please join if you're interested in being part of our group. Um, I don't have any room for anybody to be a friend on Facebook. I just checked. I've got 5,000 friends, and it means I have to kick somebody off, and I don't have the energy to do that right now. What's a new page, Gloria? Huh? No, no, that's on my personal thing. I can't start a new page for that. So I can sign up, I guess, as a new person, but they frown on that one. Um, so... Uh, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and on um, uh, LinkedIn um, and um, join a, 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 a gathering of priestesses if you're a woman. Uh, we also have the Goddess Ranch, which is on um, Facebook, and um, Raven has her book. Uh, we have Invoking the Scribes of Ancient Egypt, which is my book with Normandy Ellis, which Raven was contributor to. Uh, so there's a number of ways to reach us. Uh, you can reach me at GloriaTaylorBrown.com and um, you can also reach me right here next Tuesday night. I look forward to seeing you. Good night.